everybody. Welcome to our YouTube live today. Um, my name is Alice and this is Claire. Hi everyone. And uh, we're home economists at Smeg UK and today we are going to be showing you how to make the perfect pizza. We've been doing a series of cook-alongs uh, during this last week but all of these videos are saving onto our YouTube channel so you're either watching live or you might be watching on demand. Either way we hope you can either cook along or sit back and enjoy what we're doing today. Brilliant. So today, as we said, is all about pizza. And if you've been following us all week with our risotto and our pasta, this is in celebration of the festival Ferragusto, which is an Italian classic festival where people sit back, relax, and enjoy great food. So the perfect opportunity to share, hopefully, our expertise with you so that you can make the most of these wonderful dishes. So pizza then, what is the plan for today? We are going to be doing a multitude of different things to show you different techniques, different ideas of how to make the perfect pizza, regardless of the equipment mm -hmm. and ingredients that you've got available to you. So we're gonna share our secret recipe, not so secret, because you will get it in the link in the chat. Um, but we are going to be showing our recipe. We're gonna show you how you can make it using a machine, but mm -hmm. also do it by hand. We're going to be showing you how you can make your own passata versus a little bit of a cheat passata. It's that time of year where there's loads of tomatoes around, so it seems very, very fitting. Very topical. Yeah. <laughs> and then finally, we're going to show you a couple of ways to cook it. So Smeg has a wonderful pizza stone. You can see one of them in front of us here. We also have a rectangular one. Great in inducting the heat and giving you the most beautiful crisp base. But if you haven't got one of those, then of course, we're going to show you how to do it in a frying pan in conjunction with an oven and even just an upturned cast iron pan. So yeah. lots to get through and hopefully something for everybody. So first things first, I think we need to get straight into this. Claire, would you mind preheating the oven? Um, we're going to uh, set our oven temperature for the highest. So whatever your oven will go up to on the maximum, set it straight up there. Smeg ovens go either from 250 degrees all the way up to 280 degrees, depending on the model. And we're going to select fan assist. So that's top heat, bottom heat, and the fan in between. And that means we can get the element as hot as possible to get a beautiful crispy base. Now, depending on the oven that you have, um, you may well have one like myself, where it actually has a pizza stone function. So you've got a pizza stone function, always use this when you're handling the pizza stone. But here you can see a wonderful rectangular pizza stone that we'll be using. But there's also different ones available. You see the round one there that Alice has. Now that's ready for the pizza stone. We need to preheat it for a reasonable amount of time, at least half an hour really. Um, and that's gonna ensure that that stone gets nice and hot. So when the pizza hits it, you're gonna get that lovely crisp base and that lovely gooey topping. Now for some of the other methods where we're gonna use that cast iron pan, mm -hmm. we'll preheat the other oven and we'll use that fan assist function that Alice mentioned. So I'll yeah. do that now and we'll pop this pan just here upside down to use that flat base to cook our pizza on. Thank you very much, Claire. And it's really important to use cast iron pan or something really nice and heavy so it absorbs all of that lovely heat. So whilst Claire's preheating um, our stones and our pans over there, we're going to get started straight away with making the dough because we've got to leave this to prove. So we want to make sure we've got enough time to do that. So our recipe today is quite simple and we are going to have the recipe going into the chat. This is a fantastic pizza base recipe that is nice and doughy, but also crispy if you roll it out flat enough. So I've got in my stand mixer here, my flour already weighed out and Claire's going to start weighing hers because Claire's actually going to be doing hers by hand. She pulled the short straw here. Yeah, it was you <laughs> on the pasta one, no, it's me this time. Absolutely. So I'm gonna be doing this in the stand mixer and into the bowl, Claire is currently weighing out 175 grams of strong white bread flour. And then she's also going to be weighing out 175 grams of double zero pasta flour. Now, this pasta flour is extra finely milled. So it's not so much too different from plain flour in terms of what it's made from. It's just really finely milled, which gives the dough a really lovely velvety texture, but also means it's going to be extra crispy when we bake it. Now, if you haven't got access to that zero zero flour, it really doesn't matter. You can use a plain flour. It just won't have that fine result that Alice just mentioned. So the beauty of Italian cookery is often the ingredients you've got in your cupboard, isn't it? Absolutely. So store cupboard ingredients, nice and easy. So speaking of nice and easy, we're now about to add some fast action dried yeast. Now this is seven grams worth. 
And I've added it to one side of my bowl um, because we've got a top tip, actually, because we are going to add a dash of salt. Thank you, Claire. We're going to add a little bit of salt to the dough to add some flavour. And the top tip would be don't put the salt directly, thank you, don't put the salt directly over the yeast because that can actually kill it. So it can stop it from activating, which means you won't get a very well, well risen um, bit of dough. So it doesn't matter when they mingle together later, but as long as they're not directly touching, they'll be absolutely fine. So I'm going to um, start with my stand mixer first. You might be able to see here, I've got the dough hook attachment on. And what that's going to do is mimic the kneading process that we would do on the work surface that Claire's going to be doing. Um, but it's gonna take all of that mess and effort out of it. So we're showing you both ways so you can, uh, you can really make this at home with us. Um, we're going for tepid water. So if I put my finger in this, I shouldn't be able to really feel it at all. It should be about body temperature. So around 35, 37 degrees, if we're being very specific, but it should feel nice and quite neutral, not hot, not cold. And along with the water, we're also gonna add a little bit of olive oil and that's gonna really enrich the dough and help again crisp when it goes onto the pizza stone or on the pan. So a little drizzle of the oil, doesn't matter which order you do it, as you can see, we're tag teaming here. So a bit of oil in the bowl, then a little bit of water. And Alice, there is a rough guide to the water, but it's yeah. not necessarily a hard and fast rule, is it? It's approximately uh, 200 millilitres, but this is very much dependent on the type of flour that you're using, the batch of flour. Um, it, it really varies. You know, you can use exactly the same quantities, but you might find that you need a little bit more. And we all, always say with water, go a little bit extra with the water and add flour later on because it's really difficult to add extra water once it's already mixed. It turns quite gluey, doesn't it? It does. And you just really can't oh. add water into an already formed dough. Exactly. So if you need to rescue it the other way, you can always add more flour, yeah. but very difficult to add water. Yeah. So I've started mine off here. Uh, it's starting to knead in the bowl or really get that flour involved. So I'm gonna watch this. And as it absorbs that flour, I might need to add a dash more water Claire's got involved with her hands now. She started off with a bit of puttery, which makes it quite clean. Because I think, messy. yeah, I think traditionally it's all, you know, on the work surface and flowers flying everywhere, which by all means go for that. But uh, Claire's keeping a tidy work surface, which we greatly appreciate here. Um, so she's going to knead it with her hands in the bowl first, and then we're going to get it onto the work surface. And Claire's then going to give us some really good kneading techniques. So. I'm going to turn this up to still on a low setting, um, but of about level two. And that's just going to really gently bring in that flour from the side of my bowl. And what's nice is I've got a nice glass bowl here so you can see exactly what's happening. Great. So I'm going to start off by doing the hard work. And this one is just like, you can <laughs> sit back, relax and have a cup of tea. Um, but actually, the kneading is, is not too bad. But yeah, it does take a lot longer, double the time to yeah. mix that. So there's a couple of kneading techniques that you can use. Um, and this applies to the pasta that we did yesterday as well, very similar, albeit this is a slightly wetter dough, so it's easier to manipulate and play with mm -hmm. than the others. But essentially what we're gonna do is take the dough, pull it slightly forward, and then fold it over, twist it round, fold it over, twist it round, and you're gonna keep doing that. And when you get the hang of it, you can start to actually do that with one hand and knead the dough. And of course, kneading is super important when it comes to making any form of bread, but also pizza. Very much so, yeah. And whilst this is going to take approximately 10 minutes to knead, once all my flour has been incorporated, it's only going to take about five minutes on the stand mixer. Now, I know this is a big piece of kit and it looks best, I would say, on your work surface but perhaps you don't have the work surface room to have a stand mixer on there all yeah. the time. A lovely alternative is actually a hand mixer. So this is, of course, our snake hand mixer, and we've got here the dough attachments. So this also comes with the whisk attachments and the beater attachments to make things like cakes, meringues, but importantly for this session, dough. So we can fully knead the dough with an electronic mixer, which really does take all of the, uh, I'd say the elbow grease out yeah, of it. Yeah, the elbow grease out indeed, and actually, I've showed you one method, why not let's show you an alternative method. And this is where you use two hands rather than one. So you're literally just going to use the heel of the hand this time to roll it forward, almost into a sausage shape to start developing that gluten in the dough. And if you watch some of these celebrity chefs, they also do this method where they literally, sorry <laughs> to wake everybody up, but literally throw it onto the work surface. And that also helps to stretch the gluten. 
So the gluten, well, you're not. Yeah. Get your anger out a little bit yeah. there, Claire. Absolutely. So, yeah, this is um, all about stretching the gluten that's in the flour, it which is. will help give that pizza that lovely strength, but then give us that crispy and um, lovely soft yeah. dough at the same time. So we're looking for that elasticity. So once it's been well kneaded, you should be able to roll it into a ball and give it a poke. And if that springs back, that means that it has been kneaded enough. So when we're rolling out the pizza, it's going to be nice and elastic. We can stretch it. We can roll it out into whatever shape we like. Um, but that's the most important part, this kneading process. And after that, we're going to, almost similar to how we did with pasta yesterday, we're going to allow it to rest or prove. And it's going to double in size until we get a really beautiful, fluffy, aerated um, pizza dough, which is then going to give us some lovely bubbles. It's almost blistered when it goes onto the pizza stone, which is amazing. Yeah, and I think this dough recipe, where we're using the combination of the, the bread flour and the pasta flour, is a good one. You know, sourdough is lovely, but it takes a lot of effort, a lot of hard work, a lot of time. But this is a really quick one for you to, to get going with straight away and used um, straight away pretty much as well. Now we are um, creating, obviously, these doughs here with classic bread flour which is very glutinous. But some of you out there might have a gluten intolerance, might be celiac, or perhaps have someone who is trying to stay off the gluten. So we have got a recipe, haven't we? We do indeed. For our gluten-free customers. So conveniently, I've actually got a gluten-free flour already made, gluten-free flour, gluten-free uh, dough already made here. And I'm just gonna grab some of the ingredients to show you exactly what goes into it. Um, because it is quite different to the dough that we're making here. So whilst we're kneading it now to work the gluten, of course, if we're using gluten-free flour, there's no gluten to work. So the base of this is, of course, gluten-free flour there. And we're also going to be adding some ground almonds into the mix. This allows for a little bit of protein to get an extra crispy base and a lovely golden uh, colour too. And I think the recipe for this is going to go in the chat as well. So already gone in there. Oh, Alice. thank you We're very much. <laughs> and we've also got xanthan gum here. Now, xanthan gum is often used in gluten-free recipes because it adds that stretch that we can't achieve um, by using gluten-free flour. So a tablespoon of xanthan gum, I believe, and that really, really helps to elevate the dough. Now, if I show you what the dough looks like, it is completely different to our pizza dough. It's almost like a batter. We do mix in quite a large quantity of water. So with this, you don't treat it in the same way that you would our normal pizza dough. So we're going to be actually spooning this onto a baking tray and then you spread it out and around with the spatula and then it starts to bake. So we would bake this at 200 degrees for about 40 minutes and that allows it to firm up into a lovely pizza dough. And after you've done that, you can then top it, use it on the pizza stone as you would with a normal pizza. But we thought, why not allow gluten-free um, eaters as well to have a really lovely pizza? Because pizza's for everything. Exactly. Right, okay. So our doughs are starting to come together. Um, and if I was to show you what we're looking Ooh, lovely. for. lovely. We've got this lovely kind of ball of dough. And as Alice said earlier, if you pop your finger in it, it should just bounce back, which is exactly what is happening right now. Very nice. Now, I've made a very beautiful, smooth, round ball of dough. You might find you've got a few crinkles and creases in there. But actually, the best thing you can do, if it is crinkly, is to do that technique I showed you earlier. Tuck all the untidy bits on the underside yep. by keep spinning it around and turning it. And then once you have done it all the way around, you've got that lovely smooth top. And then use your hands to cup it from the bottom pinch those wrinkles and creases together and then we've got our dough ready and that means when it is going to do its proving process yep. it's going to go up nice and even and look perfect and be good for our pizza maker later on so we'll Amazing. pop it in a bowl I think great I think so yeah we'll get this proving straight away oh and I see we have had a question about whole wheat flour um so you can actually get whole wheat uh, bread flour so as long as it's the strong kind, um, you should be able to achieve the same results, but with a whole wheat base. Yeah. Now, I don't know about the taste of it because I've never actually had a whole wheat pizza base, but if you do give it a go, please let us know. Now, I'm going to be popping cling film onto this bowl here that Claire's just put in with a little bit of olive oil. And you'll notice I'm not actually attaching this particularly tightly. And the reason for that is 
because it's going to pretty much double in size. We want to make sure it's got growing room. So I'm going to really loosely pop that cling film on there so it still has space to rise. And the oil is in the bottom, so you can see it's sliding around. And that's going to mean that it's not going to stick to the bowl or to the cling film. So I'm going to pop this, I think, into the warming drawer. Go for it, yes. So it's just back here, our little warming drawer. And this has been heated on the proving setting, which is about 40 degrees. So if you're at home and you have a warming drawer, pop it in there. Maybe you have an airing cupboard, definitely put your dough in there if you don't have a warming drawer. Um, but a warm place will work wonders with proving dough. It will prove in roughly about 40 minutes until it's doubled in size. If you don't, you can actually leave it out on the work surface. I mean, it's quite warm in here at the moment. So if you've got a warm kitchen, fantastic. It will take anywhere from about 40 minutes to an hour to double in size. So we're actually going to see the difference because this one's going to stay here on the work surface at room temperature. And our one in the, uh, in the warming drawer is going to be at about 40 degrees. So hopefully we should get it nice and proved. Perfect, right. So um, whilst they're proving, I think we should crack on and prepare the passata. I agree. Because as I said, the, it needs time to prove. Um, and this is a perfect job to be doing in between time. However, Alice, mm. um, when it comes to um, the preparation of dough, it's not necessarily critical, is it, to, um, to make it on the day, actually? It's not, not at all. So we actually have a freezer full of dough because one of our favourite things to do is freeze it for later because I know it's actually quite a lot of effort to get your mixer out or clean the work surface down and make the dough every time you want to make pizza. So if you were following this recipe, perhaps you make double the quantity. You can, before proving, wrap it up in cling film or put it in a freezer bag, pop it in the freezer before proving, and then when you're ready to use it, take it out, for example, on the morning. Say you're having a pizza Friday, take it out on Friday morning, leave it in the fridge to defrost uh, during the day, and it will also prove at the same time. Yeah, so it's ready to go, isn't it, straight exactly. away? Exactly. And I love it when you're entertaining, particularly, because it's a, you know, pizza is such a social activity. In fact, um, for me, it tends to be a pizza and Prosecco evening, because everyone enjoys a nice glass of Prosecco, and then they can top their own pizzas, and we all just stand around the kitchen island and have a bit of fun. And of course, before that, the kids can get involved as well. Exactly, and I think this is a really fantastic option for, I mean, we're in the summer holidays right now, but maybe, you know, you've got a bit of time to kill and you're thinking, how can we get children involved in the kitchen? I mean, that kneading, I think, is so much fun. So much fun. And I think what people forget is this is such a cheaper way of making pizza. And healthier. You know, it's expensive, exactly. And you know exactly what's going into it. So talking of that, we're mm. making our own passata. We are. With our own tomatoes. I'd like to say that we grew these, but I'm sure there are a few of you out there that are in the position where all of the tomatoes are suddenly springing to life, especially with all this heat. And it's a case of what do we do with all these tomatoes? So believe it or not, passata is really, really simple, really straightforward. Um, and what we've got here is 500 grams of tomatoes. Doesn't matter what size variety, and that's the beauty. You can really tailor make the passata to the flavor that you like. And of course, add in things like herbs, spices, garlic, you name yeah. it. So we've got 500 grams of tomatoes. We're also going to put in a couple of garlic cloves. I don't know if you can pass me those just Ooh, while you're definitely. loading it up. Here we go. Lovely. Pop those there. And really, you can adapt this for any quantity of tomatoes that you have, which is the nice thing. So say you've got some left over that you really need to use up, pop them in. It doesn't matter if they're different sizes, um, if they're different colours. It all makes for a really lovely, natural, homemade passata. And I think when you're making this from scratch, you know exactly what's going into it. Um, what's better. Brilliant. Now, I have taken two rather large cloves of garlic, but we like a garlic passata. Um, and you'll have seen that I use just the flat of my knife to just bash the top to release the um, skins. But actually, um, only yesterday when we were doing our risotto cook-along and our pasta cook-along, we discussed that even just by putting them in a jar and shaking them, obviously with the lid on, will help to rustle all of those skins off. Now, you might have thought we'd chop it, but actually we don't. All we're going to do is now the shell is off, is just give it a real smash. So it's all about releasing Claire's anger today, I think. Mm, if so it's not too. the dough, it's the garlic. And they're going to go whole into the passata mix. So lots of really lovely, gorgeous flavour. And we know that when garlic cooks down, it brings out such a gorgeous sweetness. Now, again, with the sweetness, I've actually got a little bit of sugar here because whilst tomatoes do have a lot of sweetness in them, they also have a lot of acidity. So we're going to help them out by adding just a touch of granulated sugar 
into our passata and I did put a little bit of oil in on the base but I am just going to add a drop more for some extra flavour and then we're going to cook these with the lid on because this is going to keep all of that moisture in which is going to help those tomatoes break down. I'm going to pop this on a medium heat so I've got this on a level six on our induction hob now. This goes up to a nine with a power boost so it's going to cook down and make it really really lovely and delicious. Then later on we'll take the lid off to allow it to reduce a touch. Yeah so basically what we're looking for is those the tomatoes to start to break down. Mm -hmm. The skins look like they're separating from um, the flesh of the tomato and then they'll be good. Thank you. So I'll keep an eye. I think this is my cue that I need to keep an eye on the passata. Thank you, Claire. I That's didn't say right. it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. So now while we wait for that to cook, we do actually have a little bit of a blue piece moment and we've got some dough that we made earlier. So I thought that we could show you exactly how to make a garlic pizza bread because I think that is really exciting yeah. and uh, if you've got a little bit of spare dough it's a fantastic way of having um, either a dairy free option a nice little starter uh, even some nibbles if you've got friends coming around this weekend and it's a great opportunity for us to show you before we get stuck in especially if you're cooking along and we're waiting for the doughs to prove it gives us an opportunity to show you some skills on rolling out your pizza mm. and making sure that you still keep a fair amount of air in that pizza because we've gone to all this effort of putting it in there um, and then how to top it because when we start getting really you know moisture rich toppings like tomatoes on it that's when things can go a little bit crazy so watch Definitely. and listen on this one and apply all of these fab techniques that Alice is going to share with no you. No pressure. <laughs> so this is nice and oily um, because as you saw earlier we oiled the bowl before we allowed it to prove in the warming drawer. So I am actually going to ask Claire to pass me over a bit of flour please. Yes of course. No now problem. this is a really key part of, uh, of actually rolling out your dough. If you don't have enough flour on the work surface you are going to find that it sticks and if you're spending loads of time making a beautiful design which we all do, we all take a lot of pride in our pizzas, it will stick to the work surface and, uh, and we don't want that to happen. Now seeing you do that, that's reminded me that we should actually let you know um, how many pizzas this recipe makes. Now it all depends on your appetite to be honest. Definitely. So if you have a big appetite, split it into two and they will make two very large pizzas. Um, if you want to go for three medium, which I think is what most people do, I divide it into three and then small miniature pizzas would be dividing it into four. So I think we've gone for a little miniature one. Yeah. So I'm doing what Claire did earlier where she pinched the outer corners straight into the middle because this allows for one side to be looking quite rough, but the other side beautifully round and smooth. And that's exactly what we want for rolling out a nice even circle. Now that's not to say you have to do yours in a circle by any stretch of the imagination. You can get really creative with the shapes that you do. Um, we've had, gosh, so many different shapes come through the Smeg HQ doors. We've had rectangles, we've had triangles, we've had love hearts. Map of Britain. Yes, I don't think that was intentional, but we made the best out of it. It doesn't matter, it's <laughs> all about creative license. And as we've always said, it, yes, you eat with your eyes, but you certainly want it to taste good. And we know for sure that this will taste good. Definitely. So what I'm doing here is using a rolling pin just to, first of all, get that shape that I want. But we have spent quite a long time proving this dough and allowing air to come into it. So I don't want to knock all of them out. So what I'm going to do is stretch it then with my hands. And this is how you know you've done a good job with the kneading process because it should be really nice and elastic. Just hold it, shouldn't it? Although if you do get a tear in a pizza, it's not like pastry, you can stitch it together. So simply just fold a little bit of dough over the other and that of course will give you what you need. Perfect. So I've stretched it on the corners there and then I brought my knuckles into it as well. So the knuckles really help to stretch out the center too. Um, and is that looking a little bit thin? I might have a slight hole in there. So as Claire just said, just going to patch that up nice and easily and then we're ready for toppings. Okay, so. so what Alice has just shown you there is what you should be doing. So definitely only roll it so far, um, but then you want to um, use those knuckles, use the weight of the pizza to stretch it out. Now, when you are in the restaurant, does anyone, anyone seen it where the, the guys get totally, you know, theatrical and throw the pizza in the air? There isn't really anything in that, to be honest. Um, it's all for show and why not? Um, it does create a bit of theatre. We can do Woo! it, but it does nothing for the pizza. Itself. Oh, Claire, very nice. There you go. It was a risk, but I took it, and I'm pleased I took it. <laughs> I'm, well, I'm glad it wasn't me doing that. That's all I can say. Um, so we've got our really nice, 
reasonably round dough, but you know, as I say, it just means that it looks homemade, I think, if it's not 100% round. Now, I am just going to give it a little bit more of a roll just to really stretch that out there. And again, the key part here is to make sure that you have got all of that flour underneath because that is key when we are um, when we're creating our pizzas, whether that's garlic bread or pizza here. Do you want the oil? Oh, yes, please. Thank you very much. Oil. So for our garlic bread, it's really nice and simple. We're just going to go with some olive oil on the base, some fresh rosemary. I'm going to have to work fast here. She's all over this. And I'm also going to add some cheese. Now, this isn't just any cheese, may I add. This is some beautiful Parmesan. So not technically something that we would traditionally use for, uh, for cooking with, but this is an aged 12 month mature. And I'm actually just going to crumble this on um, because it's got a really beautiful, lovely, salty uh, flavor to it. And it tastes completely different when it's melted, I've got to say. Um, if ever anybody has tasted Parmesan raw before and thought, oh, I'm not too keen on that, Give it a try when it's melted because it's absolutely beautiful and it's completely different. And it's a top tip actually. We put salt in the dough, the salt in the parmesan. So I would probably season to taste post cooking yeah. rather than adding salt on right now. Definitely. Oh, so do you want any more on there? Yes, please, because Claire's also chopped up some lovely garlic for us. So that's going on. So it's essentially a cheesy garlic pizza oh bread. Oh gosh, it smells amazing. I think it's going to taste amazing too. Now, when we're talking about getting this off the work surface, there are a few ways that you can do this. This is, I would probably say the most official way, but this is a Smeg pizza shovel. And it's got a little handle at the back here that locks down into place. And it reminds me of being in a, you know, a bit of a pizza restaurant. Um, and the way we do this is I'm gonna grab a touch of flour. That's the key with this. I don't know if you've noticed, plenty of flour. And that's gonna stop it from sticking. I'm going to keep it flat to the work surface and just shuffle it straight onto the paddle. Alice made that look really easy. I did. And if you've never done it before, I would definitely recommend giving it a try when you don't have any toppings on your pizza or your garlic bread, um, because it can have a little bit of a flip if you go at an angle and you can end up making a calzone. I would say a tip, actually, is if you've got a, a wall or the edge of your work surface, go up to the edge of that work surface because then you know you're going flat rather than doing this flipping out yeah. crates scales on it and do it topless. So absolutely no toppings on there and it will be much, much easier once you've got the hang of it. Brilliant. So I'm going to pop this into the oven and I have actually just scraped off some of that flour at the side because if the flour goes straight into the oven, you might notice a bit of smoke coming out. So shuffling that onto the pizza stone and Claire's just going to shut the door and allow it to do its thing. Now, our pizza stone that you saw there is made of refractory stone, so it's really absorbent of heat. So a little bit like mimicking a stone pizza oven, it's got all of that heat in the base. When that pizza dough hits it, it's going to start bubbling and blistering immediately. All that lovely cheese is going to melt straight away. It's just amazing. Okay, so first bit done, lots of techniques shown. The passata, you can see, is getting very excited on the hop here. All of those tomatoes are starting to break down. And if I just show you here on the camera, you can see the type of consistency that we're looking for. So there's very little structure, as I say, to the tomatoes. The garlic is starting to soften as well. And I've just taken the lid off to ensure that we're going to reduce it down a little bit, because that's going to give it that thick uh, consistency that we're after. Now, um, when it comes to passata like this, you you might think okay what that's it but you can use passata in so many things not in particularly in italian cookery you can i mean we use things like this for uh the crispel if you've heard of those they're beautiful um italian pancakes that get coated with gorgeous sauce and mm. you can absolutely put passata through that uh, lasagna bolognese all these different types of things so you know if you were to make a really big batch say you uh maybe you have quite a few tomatoes growing in the garden or maybe you've got loads left over and you don't know what to do with them make a big batch of passata save it you can jar it save it for ages you can even freeze it and then pull it out whenever you need it's completely natural you know exactly what goes into it and most of all cheap to do okay so um i'm gonna go with it i'm gonna go with my passata now because there's lots of steam coming off here which means we've lost lots of moisture and it's really starting to thicken up. So we have got so much 
flavor and texture but when it comes to a pizza you probably don't want that so we're going to strain it but that's not to say that's where it's going to stop because all of these skins and um, the garlic can be used and again in other dishes can't they they can so we're all about minimizing food waste at smeg so when you get these skins and these pips, they're full of nutrients, full of fiber and full of flavor too. So if you added them into a bolognese or into a lasagna sauce, it creates a really, really beautiful kind of depth of flavor. Even if you're making soups as well, you could blitz up the skins and the roughage that we're finding here and add it in, getting those nutrients, those vitamins and minerals and a beautiful tomatoey flavor. Now, what Claire's doing here, I think, is just fantastic. There's no flavor quite like a homemade passata. But if, like me, you're sometimes strapped for time, I've got a nice way of doing passata really, really quickly and easily. So in this jug here, I've got our, uh, our food processor, and I've tipped in a tin of tomatoes. And it really is a case of simply just <laughs> blitzing up and it's going to create a really lovely passata. And there's no need to strain because if you've got tinned tomatoes, they will already be skinned. You might find a seed or two here or there, but they'll blitz up if you do it in a food processor so nice and easily. The only difference is, I would say, if you have a look at the color. So if I take this off here and oh, pop these, look at the color difference. So you can see, Homemade passata over here versus mm. our shop bought tinned tomatoes. It does make you think, doesn't it? It does indeed, but both equally delicious. Or well, I've got to say, that one smells particularly nice. So, how's it looking in there, Claire? I think we need a minute or so, oh. but they don't take long. And that's a surprising thing. I think once you've made the dough and invested that time, yep. you start rolling through all of those pizzas pretty yeah. quickly. It really isn't a time consuming process once the dough is made. Nope. You know, it's so quick and easy to do. Uh, which I think is why freezing dough is just so good because you can make it ahead of time, have it ready to go. And then, I mean, Claire, you're a lover of pizza parties, aren't you? It's just easy. It's just nice, as I say, for everybody to get involved. And, you know, everyone wants to have a go at the same time. So yeah, definitely. It takes the pressure off the host. It does. And everybody can choose their own toppings as well. So maybe you've got somebody who's a little bit of a fussy eater. Maybe they don't like cheese. Maybe they don't like... I don't know, tomato, you can absolutely vary and put whatever you like onto your pizza. Although I've got to say, that might not be traditionally Italian. Mm. <laughs> so, um, right, on that note, let's move on. Let's have a look at our doughs to see how they're proving. So um, a bit of a difference. This one has really started to, to bulge out of the bowl and it's really, you know, creating a nice volume of stone. That's because the warming drawer has accelerated it. So again, find a warm spot in the house to do so. But what we're going to do now is move on using one of the doughs that we've already made um, and show you how you can cook it in a pan. So you've got all these different methods that you can try depending on what you've got available to you at home. Fantastic. Okay. So Claire's got a really lovely non-stick pan here. Um, and it's important to have a non-stick pan for this because that allows it to really, I would say, slide about and come out nice and easily. Yeah, and, and absolutely. I mean, what it also means is, I mean, we could put some oil in the bottom for a bit of crisping and, mm -hmm. and flavour, but actually keeping it healthy because we've already put oil in the dough, we'll probably just a bit of oil on the end. I mean, Italian cookery is all about adding oil, but we um, are going to put it straight into that non-stick surface. And um, this pan here is going to be used to, in fact, um, start off the base cooking of the pizza, which is what our pizza is doing now, an oven all in one go. And we will then transfer this pan into the oven to finish cooking and melting off the top part. So with a nonstick pan, golden rule really is you shouldn't leave it empty and preheating. So all I'm doing is leaving it for a minute or so, which is allowed. Um, but please, with any nonstick surfaces, don't heat without anything in because over time it's just not going to do it any favours. No, exactly. So um, get yourself a, a really lovely non-stick pan for this if you've got one at home. Perfect. Um, but I'm just doing the exact same process that I did before for the garlic bread, which I hope would almost be ready right now because yeah. I am actually feeling a little bit hungry with all these amazing smells going on in the kitchen. So again, I'm rolling out with a rolling pin just to get that beautiful shape. And then I'm going to use its own body weight almost to really stretch it out. Are you going to throw it in the air? I mean, I can give it a go, Claire, but I've got to say it's not my forte. 
so don't do it don't do it it's too risky i mean it's all right it's a white room so it could blend into the ceiling it's yeah it might do um so again i'm using my knuckles to stretch it out there in the center so it's nice and thin but not too thin that it breaks um now if you do love a chunkier crust absolutely you can just make a thicker pizza you will need a little bit more dough if you do that but that's no problem at all okay, okay. before Ooh. you get going alice i think we have to pause and Ooh. appreciate the wonderfulness that's coming out of the, <gasps> the oven right now oh so wow if you take a look there you can see the beautiful pizza you can see the blister pops and if I pop up underneath, we can see again, look at that Amazing. golden face. That's really hot. So if you're doing that at home, <laughs> don't do it. And actually, Alice, if you've got a um, pizza wheel there. Yes, I think oh, I do. have one right by me. What we will do. I'll pop this over here just so you can see us cutting this because, Claire, I don't know about you, but I'm actually getting really hungry. Oh, gosh. You want wow. to do the crunch, don't you? Can you? I don't know if you can hear that. I don't know if you can, uh, if I get nice and close with my microphone here. That's got an amazing crunch to it. Just beautiful. There we go. Should we, should we taste? I, I think we should. I mean, it's a little bit hot, but we'll go with it. Here we go. Oh, oh, oh. No, it's really hot. Oh. Who's talking? I'll talk whilst you eat. We didn't do this very well yesterday. Oh, we? mm, that is absolutely delicious. The saltiness of the parmesan. It doesn't need any more salt. It doesn't, nothing at all. If anything, all I would do is mm. to make it perfect. Just to do an extra drizzle of oil on the top. Now that's decadent. That is decadent, but that's wow. should be done. Absolutely beautiful. Mmm. I'm I'll leave you to it. I'm just gonna eat this. Do you want me to make the next pizza? <laughs> <laughs> Alice is all mm. over it. Right. Pizza aside, we need to show you how to make a proper pizza because so we far do. it's just been the garlic bread. So um, we will change our priorities from eating to showing you how to do that. So if you are making at home at this point, hopefully you're getting involved with this now and making some lovely fresh pizza. What I'm going to do is, again, more flour. It's a classic. Um, and then popping down my rolled dough. Now, make sure your dough does fit within your pan, which does sound obvious, but I often get carried away with the rolling. And if your pan is, say, for example, 24 centimetres, in width, you want to make sure that it doesn't lift up the side too much because you want it to cook really evenly. Okay, so we've got our dough rolled out here and I've got the passata. Have you got, have you got spoons there? Oh, I think I, I think I do. I'm just going to grab one over here. <laughs> okay, well done. grab my spoon and then I'm going to spoon this onto the pizza base. Now, the key with this is to go reasonably sparingly and don't go up to the edges because we want to make sure that we've got that lovely crust and oh Claire's coming in with the oil this was a tip I learned from a real you know pizza chef add a bit of extra oil again here and this will help Chris and in Useful. fact if you want to know how to use oil really well and that's why it tastes so good watch some of the Theo Randall videos where he shows you how to make the most amazing and beautiful focaccia but I have never seen so much oil going to focaccia but then I've never tasted such good focaccia and it's that true. is on our YouTube channel as a recipe video so check it out definitely so you've got to work fast now haven't you you do so Come that's out. the uh, that's the second top tip of working with passata don't go up to the edge and work quickly because you've got to remember that this stuff does leak through that dough so Claire's adding some mozzarella onto here I'm going to add believe it or not some more parmesan just crumbling that on there bit of black pepper bit of seasoning now the controversial thing in the UK is that we're known for overtopping our pizzas and especially with things like a meat feast pizza um which I've got to say is not recommended from a traditional Italian point of view however we do have a top tip when it comes to uh, meat pizzas. Now, Italians obviously have loads of lovely, gorgeous um, cured meats. Like we've got some beautiful parma ham here. However, you've got to make sure that technically this goes on after the pizza is cooked. Or alternatively, if like us, you like it a little bit crispy, you can pop it on a minute from the end of cooking. Did you see that? wasn't quite as easy as sliding it onto the stone but this is what I mean there are other ways of doing it and it takes a little bit of you know manipulating but it got into the pan it might have folded over but give it a little shuffle again like the chefs do and it will help to flatten it out in the, the pan now it's starting to bubble it's going to take just a little bit of time in the pan as I say we're only focusing right now on the bottom and at the minute my hob that goes up to nine is on seven setting seven I might 
just put it up a little bit. You don't want to burn it. No. But you do want to start to um, get some of the, the colour on the bottom. And one of the ways to just keep an eye is just use a fish slice and every now and then just have a little look to see what's going on. So that's a bit of cheese that's caramelising, um, not the base. But again, give it a little shuffle, a little rotation. All saying that, these pans give a really good even heat. So regardless of what you've got in the pan, it's going to cook everything nice and evenly anyway. Now, you have the fish slice there, which is actually another top tip if you don't have a pizza shovel. Yeah, that's right. So you can take um, both. So in fact, you need two, really. But you can scoop your pizza up that way. But I would definitely top afterwards if that's what you're going to do. Yeah. Um, but um, I went maverick and just went into the pan. Okay. Great. So Claire's going to uh, going to manage that pizza in there. I'm going to get started with another pizza because we actually, of course, have the uh, the pan going on in the oven the as well. The upturned one that we're just going to use the, the base of. Yep. Um, so while you're rolling that out, let's have a look at that base because, as I say, it doesn't take very long. And you can kind of see it's, it's, it's similar to what we would say if this was in the oven. When you start to see some of the almost like bubbles coming through on the surface of the pizza, you know you're starting to get there and that's actually when we would add the meat isn't it but a bit further but that's starting to get some color you can see it so i'm going to pop that now into the oven so from hob to oven and i've already got a shelf in there so i'm maximizing my space and then we'll just pop the door shut and you can see how that would be so useful if you were making similar style really if you were doing an omelette you know you're working on the bottom and then you just need to finish that top bit off before you fold it over yeah absolutely so that is the pan method so the pan's going in there uh, so again nice and hot the oven on as high a temperature as it possibly can be which is key um and then i'm going to start topping this next pizza for our cast iron pan in our second oven so we've talked about garlic bread with rosemary a bit of parmesan again whatever yep. that you wish to put on top um, this one's gone in and we're going to add a little bit of meat just towards the end. Mm -hmm. As we said in Italy, it would be put on right at the very end. In fact, maybe we should do that mm. today. Um, but this last one, we're just going to go for a classic margarita. And when we were, you know, really exploring pizzas and the different flavours, there's actually a fair amount of history that's linked through to pizzas. So the one um, we're making here is the margarita pizza. Um, and history says that it was um, developed because Queen Margarita came to visit and she requested, or should we say, yeah, requested, not demanded, <laughs> um, but a pizza that had all the colours of the Italian flag. So, of course, with this one, we're going to have mozzarella on this. We're then going to top it with some basil. Remember, with basil, it doesn't like heat. So you're going to pop that on as it comes out of the oven. But then you've got your red, your white and your green. So all the colours, the Italian flag. How perfect. I love the fact you're putting a bit of cheeky um, parmesan on there as oh, well. Oh, always, and always. Lots of cheese always adds good flavour. And as we said, it adds that salty element to stop you having to season it. Now, another um, pizza that I think most people don't necessarily associate um, for its true origins is actually the Mariana pizza. Mm. Because um, the Mariana pizza, if I said to you, what would that be? And feel free to put your ideas in the chat. But um, it was actually um, developed from the seafarers. But um, it wasn't a pizza loaded, as we might think, with lots of fish and prawns and you know mussels. It was actually a very basic pizza. You're going to pop that straight into the oven. I'm not going to distract you. This is to be continued. Ooh. Go for it. We'll get it in. OK, so again, we're working quickly because we don't want that um, passata base to start uh, sticking to the work surface. So now I've got to say also, this is a little bit of a height challenge for for me here because the arm's got to get up nice and high and so shuffling point, actually, on if you are um, designing your kitchen that control panel should be at your eye level and that will ensure that it's always at the correct working height so um we're a little bit um yes vertically challenged um so these might be a little bit high for us in this kitchen so going back to um the mariana story their seafarers used to take out just dry ingredients out on the boat because they'd be out there for days mm -hmm. And what they would do is they would make their pizza dough. That was very simple and straightforward. But they'd take loads of dried herbs and spices. Um, and that would be, you know, your oreganos, everything like that. And that was the Mariana pizza. Now, like everything, it's evolved 
into this very fish laden pizza that we know. Yeah, really quite, um, quite luxurious and with lots of amazing, quite expensive seafood on it. But pizza actually originated as quite a, a basic food, didn't it, Claire? Oh, beautiful. Nothing is basic about that, I've got yeah. to say. But yeah. it was made with really simple ingredients, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was actually a food of poverty initially because it was, as I say, a lot of Italian food does come from basic pantry ingredients. Yeah. And this was one of the, the, the main staples. Everyone could afford a bit of bread and a, or yeah. a bit of flour to make up a pizza. So um, I'm just going to finish off the, the Mariana pizza. Not the Mariana, the margarita, <laughs> too many M's. The margarita pizza with some basil. Um, I might just, you know, go all out there. And even at this point, some people put an addition of the mozzarella on there as well. So you get those lovely white pops in definition. And then we will um, use the fish slice because we've got a bit of, you know, good cheese there. But that nonstick is doing its work and get it onto the surface. That's a lot of topping on there. Beautiful. It's doing really nicely. Now, let's have a look at the base, a bit of comparison here. So, yes. We've got a bit of colour, but not quite. That's the cheese you can see there. Let's go there. <laughs> not quite what we've achieved on the stone, but still a good way. It's still beautiful, of yeah. Something very similar. And of course, not those lovely little pops, but let's give it a whirl, quite literally, with our pizza wheel. <laughs> and we can get tuck in, stuck into that in a little bit too. Lovely. Right. So I'm just going to pop this final pizza onto the pizza stone just to finish off. And guys, it'd be interesting to see what your favourite toppings are, um, because I know that it's, you know, for me, it's always a pizza with a few extra anchovies on the top. That's the only way Ooh. a pizza should be served. Or my latest one is adding a bit of, and do your sausage, but essentially use up wow. everything you've got in the cupboard. Um, it's like our oh, casseroles, the pizzas, you know, it's just using up leftovers. That looks amazing. And you wouldn't believe this has been cooked in minutes in a frying pan. So simple, so easy, and it's still got that beautiful, crispy base. That's mm. absolutely, that smells delicious. I can't wait to try that. Um, we've got the pizza cooking away on the cast iron pan. How's that looking? Is it taking a little bit longer, would you say, than the it's, others? It's, it's definitely a little bit longer, but it's mm -hmm. coming on. It's not Great. far away, and I think we might be able to get it out of the oven before the session ends. So Fantastic. Even better. So hopefully you guys, if you're cooking along at home, you're following along nice and easily and if you are watching on demand as well um, as a playback of YouTube you can play and pause as you wish as you go along to make sure you catch up with us um, but really what we're aiming to do here is to create some beautiful quite healthy pizzas that you can make really easily at home with very few ingredients aside from what you've got in the cupboards at home so maybe you have some olives in a jar that you've opened pop those on maybe you've got some veggies as well you can add those to it too It'd be really experimental but the basis of our dough the passata the toppings all really simple natural ingredients indeed now today or oh, this week has been about three very classic dishes so we have done um the risotto all of the you know the fail safe tips to to really make the perfect risotto, whatever flavour again you wish to do. And um, we've made that pasta. Yep. So we've shown you how to make pasta from scratch and then stay pizza. Now, um, we've had lots of really exciting and positive response from this week's worth of Ferragusto and, and celebrations. So we'd like to bring a few more cooking sessions to you in the future. So in September, we will be doing um, one which is based on showing you how to make gnocchi. Yeah. And it's not just, you know, the gnocchi that you know, if you've had it, some people go, oh, you know, gnocchi, it's heavy, it's it's not very tasty. But if you make it from scratch, again, it's not as difficult as you think. Nope. You can boil it, you can fry it, you can put different sauces on. And that's exactly what we're going to show you. Now, when it comes to um, booking any of these, some of you will have just joined us straight through on YouTube Live, which is great. But if you head on to our Eventbrite channel, mm -hmm. Smeg UK, what you will find is all of our future events. And when you sign up there, you'll get a list of ingredients. So if you really want to go real time and live cook along, that's the best yeah, way, to, that's do the way to do it. Now, um, yes, this is going to be hopefully something you'll see more of the future. But as an appliance brand, what we're also here for you is to show you which appliances might be best for you in your kitchen based on your cooking styles. Or you might be the person that actually, you know, has some snag appliances, but you really want to make more use of them than you are, get the best out of them. So really do check out what we have going on Eventbrite. On the 8th of September, we are going to be doing an experienced snag event, which is a, a full demonstration of different heat sources on hobs, 
to the different ovens, the cooking functions, the cleaning options, and to some of those really exciting new technologies. So whether it be oven, steam, microwave. So look out for those as well. Now I'm gonna stop talking because it's about time that we check out that last pizza. And pizza shovel. Pizza shovel it is. Here so we go. Head so, this last one out, we'll top it with some meat. Right, so I'm just going to uh, whiz this off. And the cheese is beautifully melted here. I'm just going to pop this next to uh, next to this other pizza here, and it's it's chunky. I like that one. That's got a uh, a much thicker crust, um, so that is looking good. Bit of extra basil. Should we put some? Oh yes, drizzle of olive all over the top. Some of meat. Oil, some meat. Amazing. And one of the best pizzas I've had in Italy, where it's literally loaded with meat in the middle, rock it, and then drizzled with olive oil. That is how they serve pizza in Italy. And as I say, making it from scratch at home is not as difficult as we think. Not at all. Much, much easier, much, much cheaper, and much more fun when you get everybody involved. And I don't know about you, Claire, but I am gonna try a little piece of this cut pizza that's hopefully cooled a little bit. Did you see that stringy cheese? Yep, this is Chef's Pot. Wow. So enjoy everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Hopefully you picked up some really nice ideas, tips, um, and please share with us any of your pizzas that you've mm. done in the comment section or head over to our Instagram, which is at smeg underscore UK and post those pictures away. So thank you, everyone. Cheers. Oh, good point. If you enjoyed today, don't forget to let us know whether you did or not and give us all your feedback. So we've just popped into the chat our Trust Pilot review. So feel free to click on that and um, let us know. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining. Bye. 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 Mm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs>